A sleek ebony aircraft wings its way eastward over the waters of the Atlantic. The pilot is the world's greatest detective. The craft is the bat plane. And the destination is the heart of darkest Africa. Batman here, recording entry number 21A from my mission logbook. I'm currently cruising at 1,243 miles per hour at an altitude of 57,000 feet. My estimated time of arrival over Africa's Kabanzi jungle will be approximately 25 minutes from now. As for the purpose of this flight to the largely unexplored Kabanzi highlands, it all began only a few days ago, when Commissioner Gordon asked a favor of me in his office. John and Mary Tate, aren't they the man and wife team who won a Nobel Prize last year for their experiments with suspended animation? The same, Batman. And the fact that they'll be visiting Cotham City has been splashed all over the media. That's why I'd be grateful if you acted as the Tate's bodyguard while they're here. You're worried about possible action from enemy agents? Let's just say there are several unfriendly foreign powers who would have no qualms about kidnapping the Tates to obtain their vital scientific research. I'd feel a lot better if I knew you'd never be far from their side. Consider it done, Commissioner. Gordon was a cautious man, and he was right. Every major power on Earth has been trying to crack the secret of suspended animation for years, and the Tate's award-winning work in time suspension biology seemed to put them closer to perfecting the process than anyone else. All these thoughts ran through my mind as I met the famous couple that afternoon at Gotham Airport. That man, this is indeed an honor. Told Mary and me to expect such an esteemed figure to offer himself as our guide to Gotham City. John and I have been in awe of you for years, Daddy. That is one feeling, Mrs. Tate, I assure you, is mutual. I consider it a privilege to be of service. I arranged to have the best suite at the Gotham Hilton awaiting the Tates, and I made sure I was in the next room. After a busy night of dinners and functions, the Tates retired to their suite for a well-earned night's sleep. I, on the other hand, remained on guard in my room next door, using transcendental meditation to ease my mind into a relaxed level of consciousness. Relaxed, but ever alert. Much of the night drifted by peacefully, and then I heard it. My TM trance was suddenly interrupted by the sound of a breaking window. The split second I rushed into their suite, I was attacked by what I never had a chance to see. It was so dark. I struggled furiously, but it was already too late. My mystery attacker had me from behind, and the crushing grip of a bear hug not even a grizzly could have matched. Within scant seconds, the vice-like grip had the best of me. I passed out. The next day, I couldn't turn on a TV or radio or even pick up a paper without hearing the same story. And we here at WKGC can't help wondering if Batman's failure to rescue John and Mary Tate last night is a sign that it may finally be time for the cowled crusader to hang up his cowl. After all, the famous Nobel Prize winning team is now missing and many people hold Batman responsible. But I was too busy to indulge bad publicity as my faithful butler Alfred helped me conduct a series of exhaustive scientific tests in the crime lab of the Batcave. I think we have it, sir. I believe this last battery of tests has narrowed down the classification of the pollen traces you scraped from your uniform after your skirmish last night. You're right, Albert. I'm cross-checking the geographic tables now. Ah, here we are. The pollen is Reptilus parina, and it is only distributed by plants in the Kabanzi jungle in Africa. That means whoever kidnapped the Tates last night came from that jungle. Most intriguing. I'll fuel the back plane for takeoff, sir. Sir? Yes, Alfred? About those unexplained traces of fur you found at the Tate suite, have you reached any conclusions? None, Alfred. At least none that makes any kind of sense yet. Moments later, I was winging my way eastward, leaving the Batcave and Gotham City behind, with one slim clue to go on and no idea what lay waiting for me in Africa. And speaking of Africa, I see the Kabanzi jungle is coming up directly ahead. It's time for me to wrap up this report. But before the caped crusader can end his log entry and switch off the tape...
Finally, the smoldering and crippled bat plane comes to rest, leaving a torn and tattered figure slumped in the cockpit, a cowled figure that does not move or utter a sound. For many hours, the scene remains unchanged as life in the jungle proceeds in primitive ignorance of the damaged aircraft and its unmoving passenger. And then, as sunset filters through the tropical trees, a pair of rescuers appears, gently removing the limp, unconscious crime fighter from the shattered cockpit. Did he sustain any permanent damage, do you think? Yeah, I would say negative. A mild concussion, several bruises and lacerations... His injuries do not seem to extend beyond that. Once we get him into the city, our healing facility should completely restore his health. Right. To the city, then. The two rescuers lumber away, effortlessly carrying the 180-pound Batman between them. Effortlessly. Because these rescuers are both gorillas. Hours pass. The caped crusader groggily moans and stirs. But it is not tropical vegetation and African wilds he opens his eyes to see. Instead, it is the antiseptic confines of an incredibly well-equipped, highly advanced laboratory. Where... where am I? Have you ever heard of Gorilla City, Batman? You're a prisoner here now, just like John and me. Great Scott! John and Mary Tate! Imagine a super-advanced city in the heart of darkest Africa built and inhabited by apes, far more intelligent than man himself. A city that is even invisible to the human eye, surrounded by a special force field only its gorilla inhabitants can see. John and I had heard the legends like everyone else, but we never dreamed they were all true. Batman always knew they were true, didn't you, Batman? All eyes turn toward the source of that chilling, compelling voice of pure evil. The voice of Grodd, the most powerful and formidable of all the apes. Grodd, the super gorilla. Tell them, Batman. Tell the Tates how cleverly you worked your way in here. Why don't you explain it, Grodd? And I shall. A Batman, you see, no doubt used that renowned detective skill of his to pinpoint some clue my gorilla agent must have left behind at the scene of your abduction, Mr. and Mrs. Tate. A clue that he could trace here to the Kabanzi jungle. Being as unusually well-informed as he is, Batman knew Gorilla City was purported to be in Kabanzi, although no human being had ever seen it. So what did Batman do? He deliberately crashed his plane and knocked himself out figuring he'd be brought into Corilla City as a prisoner. Batman, we appreciate all the trouble you went to. You must understand, the experiments we've been conducting here are against our will. Grodd has also kidnapped our daughter and has threatened her safety if we don't do exactly as he says. That sounds like your style, Grodd. Just what is it about the Tate suspended animation work you find so fascinating? You're about to find out for yourself. Batman. Even before he can make a move to defend himself, Batman is seized by two guerrilla guards and placed inside a plexiglass booth hooked up to an ominous pulsating machine. A machine monitored by John and Mary Tate. You see this little gadget I hold in my hand, Batman? It's the remote control device that regulates the rather large apparatus next to you. The Tates call it a biological break. What it does is slow down a person's metabolism and body functions to an absolute minimum to prepare him for suspended animation. It would even work on gorillas if the setting were correct. But today, you are our guinea pig, Batman. Shall we begin? Rod presses the remote control device. The biological brake is activated, and a bolt of shimmering energy seems to flash through Batman's body. A moment later, the plexiglass booth is raised, and its prisoner staggers out. Something wrong, Batman? You look a bit under the weather. Why don't you say something? Anything. What's happening to me? Very simple, Batman. You have become a living example of slow motion. You now walk, talk, react, even think ten times slower than a normal man. The world's greatest detective has been rendered totally useless. Now let's see how good you are at defending yourself. Don't do that. Stop it, Grodd. You're tossing him around like he was a rag doll. Please stop. You'll kill him. Hardly. 
Batman does not deserve such an easy death. I am through toying with him for now. What I have in mind for his demise will be far more excruciating. At once, John and Mary rush to the fallen Cape Crusader's side, only to discover... Oh, no! It can't be! Oh! He's dead, Grodd. I hope you're satisfied now. 